Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The Sea Dogs was an informal name bestowed upon English privateers who were authorized by Queen Elizabeth I to raid England's enemies, even during times of peace. Carrying letters of mark issued by the English crown, the Sea Dogs frequently attacked both enemy shipping at sea and enemy outposts on land especially targeting the Spanish in North American waters and ports. One of these celebrated sea dogs was seasoned soldier Richard Grenville, the eldest son and heir of Sir Roger Grenville, who was captain of King Henry VIII's warship Mary Rose when it sank in Portsmouth Harbor in 1545. Sir Walter Raleigh, Queen Elizabeth's knight lord and governor of Virginia, planned a first colony and military operation focused on the exploration and evaluation of natural resources of the New World land granted him by his sovereign. A fleet consisting of seven ships departed Plymouth, England in April 1585. When Elizabeth refused to let Raleigh make the voyage to Roanoke Island, his cousin, Sir Richard Grenville, took his place. Arriving in late June, Grenville and his men explored a great deal of territory seeking a site for the colony. The Native Americans in the region observed the Europeans and soon made contact with the English and established friendly relations. The English spoke highly of the tribe's hospitality and the strategic location of the nearby island of Roanoke. The expedition's reports described the region as a pleasant and bountiful land like the Garden of Eden. The tribe that controlled the area met with Grenville and Governor Ralph Lane to provide land for the English settlement on Roanoke Island. Both sides agreed that the island was strategically located for access to the ocean and to avoid detection from Spanish patrols after plundering Spanish ships. Lane began construction of a fort on the north side of the island. By late summer, a fort was built on Roanoke, and late August, Grenville left 107 men with Governor Lane and sailed for England. Days later, in Bermuda, Grenville raided a large Spanish galleon which had become separated from the rest of its fleet. The merchant ship, which Grenville took back to England as a prize, was loaded with enough treasure to make the entire Roanoke expedition profitable, spurring excitement in Queen Elizabeth's court about Raleigh's colonization efforts. In the year of our Lord 1586, Sir Walter Raleigh, at his own charge, prepared a ship of an hundred tons, freighted with all manner of things in most plentiful manner, for the supply and relief of his colony then remaining in Virginia. But before they set sail from England, it was after Easter, so that our colony half despaired of the coming of any supply wherefore every man prepared for himself, determining resolutely to spend the residue of their life in that country. And for the better performance of this, their determination, they sowed, planted, and set such things as were necessary for their relief in so plentiful a manner as might have sufficed them two years without any further labor. Thus, trusting to their own harvest, they passed the summer till the 10th of June, at which time their corn, which they had sowed, was within one fortnight of reaping. But then it happened that Sir Francis Drake, in his prosperous return from the sacking of St. Domingo, Cartagena, and St. Augustine, determined in his way homeward to visit his countrymen, the English colony then remaining in Virginia. So passing along the coasts of Florida, he fell with the parts where our English colony inhabited, and having espied some of that company, there he anchored and went a land where he conferred with them of their state and welfare, and how things had passed with them. They answered him that they lived all, but hitherto in some scarcity, and as yet could hear of no supply out of England. Therefore, they requested him that he would leave with them some two or three ships, that if in some reasonable time they heard not out of England, they might then return themselves, which he agreed to. 
Whilst some were then writing their letters to send into England, and others making reports of the accidents of their travels each to other, some on land, some on board, a great storm arose, and drove most of their fleet from their anchors to sea, in which ships at that instant were the chiefest of the English colony. The rest on land, perceiving this, hasted to those three sails which were appointed to be left there, and for fear they should be left behind, they left all things confusedly, as if they had been chased from thence by a mighty army, and no doubt so they were, for the hand of God came upon them for the cruelty and outrages committed by some of them against the native inhabitants of that country. Immediately after the departing of our English colony out of this paradise of the world, the ship above mentioned sent and set forth at the charges of Sir Walter Raleigh and his direction arrived at Hatteras, who, after some time spent in seeking our colony up in the country and not finding them, returned with all the aforesaid provision into England. About fourteen or fifteen days after the departure of the aforesaid ship, Sir Richard Grenville, General of Virginia, accompanied with three ships, well appointed for the same voyage, arrived there, who, not finding the aforesaid ship according to his expectation, nor hearing any news of our English colony, there seated and left by him anno 1585, himself traveling up into diverse places of the country, as well to see if he could hear any news of the colony left there by him the year before, under the charge of Master Lane, his deputy, as also to discover some places of the country. But after some time spent therein, not hearing any news of them, and finding the places which they inhabited desolate, yet unwilling to lose the possession of the country which Englishmen had so long held. After good deliberation, he determined to leave some men behind to retain possession of the country, whereupon he landed fifteen men in the Isle of Roanoke, furnished plentifully with all manner of provision for two years, and so departed for England. The second half of the 16th century was the birth of the English global empire, which included North America and Ireland. The English Pale was the part of Ireland that was directly under the control of the English government during Tudor times. It was an area along the east coast centered on the city of Dublin. The word Pale derives ultimately from the Latin word Palus, meaning stake, specifically a stake used to support a fence. From this came the figurative meaning of boundary and, eventually, the phrase beyond the pale, as something outside the boundary. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.